Now let us continue our um, revisiting of the Dave Does Disney history. Let us look back on some of the original videos. And uh, obviously, um, obviously, I, I have done uh, commentaries on Patreon years ago. So this, those of you who have been with the Patreon for a while are going to hear some redundant info here. But, you know, what is content if not recycled information? <laughs> uh, so let us visit Dave of Disney for a while. Let us revisit episode one. Ah, uh, the old disclaimer. And I'm at Disney World! As many of my friends can tell you, I'm something of a theme park geek. As well as a movie, TV, adventure game, comedy, voice acting, Tolkien, Star Wars, Calvin and Hobbes, MST3K, Weird Al, Jonathan Bolton, and Mexican food geek. But believe it or not, I've never been to Walt Disney World before this year. We never went to Florida growing up, we always visited family in California, so I've been to It was Disney a simpler hair time. World, ...despite living on the East Coast my whole life. Sort of like how I've lived in the U.S. my whole life, but only ever visited the Canadian side of Niagara Falls. But I spent some time living in Florida this year, and I had a seasonal pass. So I'm about to see firsthand for the first time just what the differences between Disneyland and Disney World are. And I'm inviting you along on this journey. First key difference I can see, right? So in terms of things I do differently, one of the things, oh, there, there's a flattering uh, image of my face. Um, we've been talking about things I would have done differently. And one of them was, had I known what this was going to evolve into, I would have filmed a lot more live shows to riff them. And I would have done a full riff of Dream Along with Mickey instead of just sort of stealing some footage of it uh along <laughs> along the way so uh yeah some of the things i would do differently are some of them are because my sensibilities have changed but some of the things i would do differently are just because i did not go nearly far enough because i did not expect this to uh blow up the way it did <laughs> so that is the first of things I would do differently is I would actually riff Dream Along with Mickey if I were doing it now. And maybe if I ever go back to Florida and that show still exists in any form, there will be opportunity, maybe. Right now is that at Disney World, sometimes water falls from the sky. And of course, as the famous song tells us, in Southern California, it never rains. The best place to begin is the section of Walt Disney World that got most of its older brother's DNA, the Magic Kingdom. It's the most direct clone of Disneyland, but it's not quite identical. Several of the rides that would be in Tomorrowland are in other Orlando parks, and some Disneyland rides have no equivalent here at all. Another thing I would have done differently is actually credit where I got still images from. I credited uh, video clips, and I credited you know, music and everything, but I did not keep track of where I got all the still images from, and I do regret that because I do believe in proper attribution at all times and uh yeah i believe these uh disneyland tomorrowland photos are just i think they were just from wikipedia so they are on wikipedia commons so they were probably creative commons photos to begin with but it still would have been uh more polite of me to actually credit the photographers and uh, i do regret not doing that but at the start, the parks are very similar. Both parks are surrounded by old-fashioned railroads that service travel shortcuts between the lands, but Orlando's Railroad is more of an attraction in and of itself, with more dioramas and sights along the way. After the entrance with the giant flowery Mickey face, you find yourself in Main Street, USA. Main Street isn't known for its rides, but it is known for featuring the key difference between a simple amusement park and a theme park. Atmosphere. Any so I also, uh, again, not knowing that this was going to be a whole thing, I just had a very little bit of B-roll I shot of Main Street, and I kind of just like stealing clips from myself here in order to pad it out to actually be uh, a Main Street section. Uh, so, you know, I filmed this guy playing piano, and uh, I had the camera rolling as I was just walking around, and then I had to kind of piece that together into something that was almost watchable. And... Uh, 
you know, I did believe in borrowing footage at the, t- at the time I did not believe in borrowing footage from other sources. Um, since then I've kind of relaxed on that as long as I'm crediting the other sources, but only when there's, you know, no alternative. Um, and, uh, so yeah, this main street section, uh, again, people who've been with the Patreon for a while have seen, uh, a cut of main street section of Blitz Travifornia, which goes into much more detail than this. Here I was uh, working with what I had filmed because again, I was in Connecticut when I edited this, not in Florida. It does rain sometimes in California, but not nearly as much as it does in Florida. We are constantly in a drought. And then when we do suddenly get rain, it's usually when I'm driving a long distance. Moving on. Anyone can put a fence around Main Street continues. A Ferris wheel charge 50 bucks and call an amusement park. But a theme park transports you to another world. Walt Disney basically invented the theme park, and he wanted people to feel like they left their troubles far behind when they entered. Kind of a re- reductive to history to say Walt toddler, invented the, the theme park, but you know. dripping with atmosphere, taking you to a slice of Americana that probably never really existed, but feels undeniably welcoming. Going now. I also believe that uh, that little Steamboat Willie display stopped being there very shortly after I got that footage, but that was inside um, the building that is where Lincoln is in Disneyland, but uh, not in Disney World. <clears throat> and um, yes, there's uh, all the rain in SoCal is LaCroix and all the grass is kale. Just like California Dreamin'. All the grass is kale, and the sky is Leroy. Yeah, that was one of the things I did want to uh, make sure I got to was, you know, making it clear I'm a theme park geek. I'm a theme park geek, not really an amusement park geek. Um, yeah, if anything, I think Walt Disney and his team sort of crafted the perfect mashup of everything that became like the modern idea of a theme park. Um, But it was mostly by taking what other parks did. Uh, It was mostly mostly by uh, taking what other parks did and then just cutting out the parts he didn't like. Yes, very, very true. Um, I will say Walt had more claim to be someone who created things than say your Elon Musk's of the world. And, but yeah, this is a, this shot goofy statue. Again, it was just me leaving camera rolling while I was walking around and I was like, I need more footage to pad out to meet the narration and, uh, here we Down go. The street, you approach Cinderella's castle, and holy crap, is it huge! Seriously, it's over twice as tall as Sleeping Beauty's castle at Disneyland. I guess Prince Philip is less worried about compensation than Prince Charming is. The, castle the first is surrounded dick joke in Dave does Disney. Kingdom. Let's begin with Adventureland. I'm going to be talking a lot about things that I think Disneyland does better. So let's start with something I prefer in Walt Disney World: the Swiss Family Robinson Treehouse. About 10 years ago, Disneyland replaced their copy of this attraction with the Tarzan Treehouse. It's basically the same thing either way, walking around looking at dioramas based on scenes from the movie, but I never really cared for the Tarzan version because Tarzan wasn't a big part of my childhood. Swiss Family Robinson was. It had ostrich racing and killing pirates with coconut bombs. What more could a kid want? So for the sake of pure nostalgia, I'm really happy Magic Kingdom kept the Robinson version. Moving on, we come to a ride that is either awesome or... Well, uh, they had representation, kind of, when it was, uh, when they were part of Secret Sorcerers, and that's about it. Um... See, I believe in small castle supremacy. <laughs> I, I, I am... 
So I, I go over it in the Blitz California, but I prefer charming to overwhelming. <laughs> I do Tarzan Treehouse occasionally, but uh, yeah, it's mostly just a bunch of stairs and walking. And um, I did find out after I made this video that uh, they would have closed the treehouse altogether in California if they hadn't refurbed it to Tarzan. So I guess I'm glad that it saved the treehouse just because there are so few walkthrough attractions in Disneyland anymore. And I, I like that it's there, even if I don't do it very often. All right. Or tedious, depending on how much fun your cast member is having. The Jungle Cruise. I will not sing Skipper Dan. I will not sing Skipper Dan. I will not sing Skipper Dan. You know what? I think I'm going to sing Skipper Dan. I'm a tour guide on the Jungle Cruise ride. Skipper Dan is the name. And I'm doing 34 shows every day. Hello, every copyright bot. It's the same. Um, still haven't seen the movie. I'm looking forward to seeing the movie. I I should also mention, um, as you can tell, that bit was kind of before I knew how big of a review thing this would be because I don't really say anything about the Jungle Cruise. Uh, I, I I don't really have any commentary on the nature of the Jungle Cruise. I just use the B-roll under the song. And uh, I filmed that before the album Alpocalypse was out. That was uh, back when Skipper Dan was just part of internet leaks. And I remember the Skipper Dan song dropped only like a week or so after I had revisited Disneyland for the first time in ages. So it was a, uh, it, it, it was, it dropped at a time when my hyperfixation on theme parks was coming back. Um, and uh, I'm, so I, I was very happy that Weird Al did a song about the Jungle Cruise. I also, uh, the one visit I made Disneyland three opening was while Jungle Cruise was still closed. So I, have not seen the new changes to it. I'm um, looking forward to checking those out at some point. Um, my hot take on Jungle Cruise is that it is a cruise through the jungle. My other hot take was that uh, I knew that Florida's Jungle Cruise was different than California's, and I realized that was mostly like I should have talked about that in the series where I'm comparing Florida to California but I could not remember enough details from California to know exactly how much was different. I just knew that California did not have the temples you go through. Um, so, uh, yeah, like I said, I did not know how big this project would become when I was working on it. I will not. I will not think Skipper Dan is my new Twilight Zone Tower of Terror. Good Lord, that is, uh, yeah, that is my legacy. My my legacy is referencing a Weird Al song at the place the song is about. Adventureland has a few other attractions, such as the Aladdin carpets, which are basically a clone of the Dumbo ride, and a newer version of the Tiki Room taken over by Iago and Zazu. I never uh, did under new management before it switched back to regular Tiki Room, so I didn't really have. Uh, I, I I I did not really have comments on it other than just comments on the concept. So uh, we will. <laughs> Maybe someday I will the dynamic co -host duos. You think dig Gilbert up Gottfried old footage of it and riff But it. the most famous and popular attraction is only in Adventureland because Orlando doesn't have a New Orleans Square. Built in Disneyland in 1967 and Disney World in 1973, odds are, there are actually, if you grew up with Disney parks... There, there are people I 
generally agree with who did like new management. So maybe I would have been the weirdo. I would have been one of the weirdos who liked it uh, when it was a thing. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, never did it in person because partly because uh, for my first, uh, sorry, partly because for my first stretch in Florida, I didn't have a car of my own. So I was only going to the park with other people and doing what they wanted to do. Uh, which is why the Animal Kingdom episode is so short. Um, anyway, you grew up with Pirates of the here Mario is the rant that Mario changed my life forever. The franchise that gave us one of the funniest pirate characters of all time, Guy Rush Threepwood. And the first of many adventure game uh, references. The first of constant Monkey Island references. And this is okay, I hate to run. And yeah, that montage was me basically taking every visual moment that I could remember offhand from the Monkey Island series that were uh, direct pirates homages um and uh yeah i like j just offhand i remembered several moments from the monk island games that were directly based on pirates and uh some of them were obviously uh more obvious than others um, oh i already put that one there um uh, my thoughts on the Pirates films are I still haven't seen any of the ones after the third one. <laughs> the most I saw is when they were doing the preview for the latest one in uh, in the former Muppet Vision Theater at DCA. I uh, watched the preview. And uh, yes, that is exactly uh, what the joke was intended to be there. It was intended to be a bait and switch. Uh, but yeah, I still haven't seen, I know the fourth one was based on the same book. I, I did another sketch about it, how the fourth one was based on the same book that was the other chief inspiration for Monkey Island. So, um, wild. And now Disney owns Monkey Island too. And I don't think they know they own Monkey Island because it's a Lucasfilm thing that's not indie or Star Wars. So uh, maybe someday they'll remember that they own it. But uh, who knows? Anyway, here's the rant. I this whole video for a rant, but this is the internet. So, first off, yes, I enjoyed all three Pirates of the Caribbean movies. They were a bit overrated, but they had fun characters, some cool action, and the most delightfully convoluted plot lines outside of an Arrested Development episode. That said, elements from the movies don't belong in the ride. The movie was based on the ride. You don't go back and change the original to accommodate the spinoff. Who do you think you are, George Lucas? It's like going back to all subsequent printings of Lord of the Rings and replacing Glorfindel with Arwen. Well, it's not quite that sacrilegious, but it still annoys me. And that's first of uh, many uh, Lord of the Rings references. Um, I've since softened on uh, the idea that nothing from the movie should be in the ride. I, I think if they had put one or two Jack Sparrows in, it would have been okay. I'm more still... Like, I don't like that the entire plot of the ride was rewritten to revolve around Jack Sparrow. Uh, so, you know, you know, uh, my, my opinions have shifted in, in, uh, in the years to come, but I still liked the ride better back when it was a more uh, ambiguous story. Okay, so this Davy Jones effect is actually pretty awesome, but the CGI feels unbelievably out of place among the 30 to 40 year old animatronics. And in California, they since to replace that with a much better effect that actually feels uh, like it belongs in the ride with the, uh, with the transforming pirate skeleton. And I do love Jeffrey Rush's Barbosa in the movies, but Paul Freeze's Wicked Wench Captain was a freaking icon and it's just not the same without him. And the Jack Sparrows, oh, the Jack Sparrows. Admittedly, Jack Sparrow coming out of this barrel is more kid-friendly than what was originally there, but these are pirates! Besides, the kids are hiding their eyes from the skeletons. They won't see the naked woman. But the worst offense is that almost every pirate in the ride is now talking about Jack Sparrow. Barbosa I think 
if Haunted Mansion had been a bigger hit, they would have put something from the movie in the ride. But I think uh, by the time they got to Jungle Cruise, they were they were like, let's let's uh, play it back. They own the first Sam and Max game, and I think they own the Sam and Max cartoon series because I believe that was. I don't know if it was owned by Fox, but I know it aired on Fox. So if it was owned by Fox, they own that too. Um, and yeah, and Steve Purcell works at Pixar. They don't own the characters of Sam and Max. Steve owns them personally. But yeah, Disney could do something with... Disney has all the ins to do something with Sam and Max if they want to. I am optimistic for... Uh, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic for that rumored new Pirates movie centering around Red. Um, it might suck, but I, I like the idea of them going in different directions. I mean, even when Jack Sparrow is in the ride, they're still asking where be Captain Jack Sparrow. Um, oh, yes, a chair. I forgot. Um, I think Tony Baxter said at one point they were going to change the load area to the uh, to the sort of conservatory that you see in the movie, which is like one of the few rooms in the movie that's not directly based on a room from the ride. Uh, but that never happened. And yeah, my theory is still they would have replaced the uh, caretaker with animatronic Eddie Murphy since um, the caretaker was going to be a character in the movie. Played by Don Knotts, but uh, he got written out before filming began. And um, I feel like that movie would have been a good 30% better if Don Knotts was in it playing the uh, groundskeeper. Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think so. Uh, Shanghai's Pirates looks very cool. Uh, I've, I've only seen footage of it, and I know footage doesn't quite do things justice, but it looks really cool. And I think I would have been happier if there was space to build, like, second Pirates attractions near the original ride that were more about the movies than, uh, than, than yeah. I feel like the casting of Don Knotts like the original announced casting of Don Knotts in the movie, first off, he does kind of look like the groundskeeper character, so it would have been a very good fit. But also, I feel like it was, you know, a big reference to like the ghost in Mr. Chicken, you know, it, it, it would have been a, uh, it, it, it would have been a nice legacy thing for him to show up in that movie. But I guess they figured there was no room for another human character in the story they were telling. I don't think that's happened. The most is um, when they were uh, promoting the Beauty and the Beast remake, they changed the Pinocchio restaurant in Fantasyland in California to a Beauty and the Beast restaurant. And they have both uh, the original cartoon designs and the remake designs of some of the characters peppered throughout the thing. So it's a weird like, Nexus of both worlds. Is looking for him. The guys dunking Carlos are looking for him. The poop pirates hiding the map from him. They gave the pirates ride a direct storyline. That's just raw. The entire fun of growing up riding Pirates of the Caribbean was the mystery of it all. You enter this mysterious faraway world that you don't know, and you get to use your imagination as you wonder who these pirates are and what their story is. And if I may return to Monkey Island for a second, Ron Gilbert has stated that half of the inspiration for the tone of the first game was wanting to get off the boat, explore the settings, and find out who the characters on this ride are. You don't get that same sense of wonder when they tell you that Jack is responsible for all this like a self-insert Mary Sue in a bad fanfic. Hell, half- Another thing I probably would have done differently is, um, <laughs> this rant, I, I probably would have uh, toned down some of the terminology that is uh, that has been used mostly by um, oh, shall we say toxic assholes on the internet. <laughs> I I I, uh, I I I probably would have been a little less le like 
I, I, I would have gone less self-insert Mary Sue with my uh, descriptor of Jack Sparrow and more uh, Slimer and the real Ghostbusters in my, uh, in my depiction of, cause, cause you know, there's, there's never any talks, any toxicness with Ghostbusters discussions. No. Um, but, uh, yeah, simpler time, simpler time. I, I also would have clarified more the pirates original ride, I think does have a clear emotional arc. But it's handled subtly and it doesn't beat you over the head with like, these are the story beats of what's happening. I, I, I think storyline was the wrong terminology. So that was another thing I probably would have um, changed. But I, I still think it's important that uh, that be. Um, I, I, I still miss the more imaginative elements of the original version of the ride. I don't think any talks about Slimer, the character himself. I'm just speaking strictly about how, at a certain point, the executives decided this character needs to take over the franchise. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's like it feels like a mythology in the original version of the ride, and less like one character is the center of everything. And honestly, the more uh, honestly, it feels like another Star Wars connection where it's like. Everything always has to come back to the same three family members, even when it looks like it's going to go off in a different direction. I mean, there was one in development written by the, one of the pirate screenwriters. And uh, when Lucas was thinking of starting an animation division and uh, that got scrapped. So uh, I forget if it was, Ted or Terry, but whichever screenwriter it was, then just use the ideas when uh, doing Pirates of the Caribbean. Okay, that I would love. <laughs> that I would love. Just Iago, Iago coming around. Just, just, uh, well, it's like if they had done the, um, the Muppet takeover of Disneyland that was uh, in development before it got scrapped because all of the Muppet Disney stuff got scrapped when Jim died. And uh, one of the elements of the takeover was going to be one of the pirates chasing a woman around was going to be replaced by Animal. And I kind of love the idea of just like, if Disneyland is the place where all the characters from all the franchises live, I kind of love them just showing up in each other's rides. Okay. Half of the fun of the movies was seeing them reference so many scenes from the ride, weaving them into the story, like it was one interpretation of what was going on in the ride. That couldn't have even happened in the first place if the ride had just told us what was going on like this. Sadly, these updates have been made at both Anaheim and Orlando, so I'll just have to learn to accept them. But how do the East and West Coast versions compare to each other? Well, I'm complaining about a lot right now, so I'll start with one aspect I actually prefer in Orlando. The line area. In Disneyland, it zigzags you in Don't front of the house, then you go inside and wait a little longer and get in the boat. Magic Kingdom at least takes you past cannons, cargo holds, and other stuff that feels like it belongs in a pirate story. Other than that, the Magic Kingdom version is, um, short. Seriously, it's something like half as long as its Disneyland forebear. There's no Blue Bayou restaurant, no calm yet haunting Vandross drumming, which incidentally was another thing Monkey Island referenced, no talking skull, only one drop, fewer treasure rooms and skeletons, and no awesome gunfight in an explosives warehouse at the end. I've actually heard, um, I've heard a case made that uh, part of the reason Magic Kingdom can be shorter is that it doesn't need as much setup as uh, Disneyland does because all the setup happens in the queue, like like the tonal setup all happens in the queue. And like I said earlier, in Disneyland, we don't really get that tonal setup in the queue. So the uh, ride itself has to do that with all the tunnels and everything. And I respect that stance, but I like, but as much as I prefer the queue in Florida, I still like being on the ride for longer. <laughs> So, uh, 
Yeah, the only reason I can imagine why they didn't do House of Mouse is uh, an actual House of Mouse restaurant is they didn't have space in Toontown for it. Um. Yeah, the, the, obviously, like, the tale has been told elsewhere, and I, I didn't know about this at the time I made the video, but the tale has been told elsewhere about how part of the reason Pirates in Florida is so small is that the park didn't open with Pirates because it didn't open with New Orleans Square because they were like, well, that's not exotic for Floridians. And, you know, we're too close to the real Caribbean for that to be interesting, and they were going to do Western River Expedition instead. But, like, the number one complaint they got in opening year of Disney World was like, where's Pirates of the Caribbean? We want to ride Pirates of the Caribbean. So they had to very quickly build a much smaller Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, that is true on both coasts, that uh, uh, the drop on both coasts in Pirates is get you into a tunnel to go into the other building on the other side of the train tracks because they did not have space within the train tracks to build the ride. I have not been to any of the non-Dis Park yet, but I sure would like to someday, but uh, you know, only when it actually feels safe to travel and also when I can afford it. Um, uh, I want to see it. I, I like uh, James Gunn movies and I really like uh, Birds of Prey, so I like Margot's Harley Quinn. So yeah, I'd like to see Suicide Squad at some point. Yes, well, as they say, uh, no good idea in Imagineering goes unused forever. So uh, a lot of what was going to be in Western River Expedition ended up getting uh, worked into other attractions and also, a lot of what was going to be in it was, you know, just uh, take it on the Calico Mine ride at Knott's, but, you know, you know, you know. Yeah, that's a weird thing that soft reboots seem to do <laughs> is, is just change the article. Um, and, and like sequels at a certain point, like, like whichever installment of the Fast and the Furious franchise just called it Fast and Furious. Uh, Pirates Mansion is something I can never really choose. I think I ride Mansion a little more often because um, I don't know why. I, I, I think I ride Mansion a little more often, but I love both dearly. Yeah. Granted, while the gunfight at the end of Disneyland's Pirates is cool, I did always think being pulled up the hill without another drop at the end was anticlimactic, and the Walt Disney World version has the famous jail scene at the very end, which is actually an interesting idea. And despite a touch of 80s sitcom style, ha -ha, here we go again, with the goofy escape attempts, it shows the ultimate consequences of a life of piracy, which would leave the ride with a very poignant and somber impression, were it not immediately followed by a drunk singing Jack Sparrow. Yeah. So long story short, Pirates of the Caribbean at Walt Disney World is nowhere near as great as Pirates at Disneyland, and Pirates at Disneyland of today is nowhere near as great as Pirates at Disneyland of the past. But despite my complaints, I still love the ride. I may not like the new changes, but there's still plenty of goodness there, and they haven't completely destroyed the atmosphere yet. And as far as songs from Disney rides go, I don't really mind getting this one stuck in my head. <laughs> yo, oh, yo, oh, yo, but my favorite ride in Adventureland has always been the Indiana Jones Adventure. Temple of the Forbidden Eye. Orlando doesn't have it at all. Uh, a couple of uh, rides at Magic Mountain do the lift hill at the end without a drop, like uh, um, Roaring Rapids as well, uh, which I may or may not get into in the book Travel form, yeah. It's like they asked me everything that I thought was perfect about Disneyland and decided to do the opposite. Is this park run by Disney or Fox? That age, weirdly. So, uh, I guess we have no choice but to move on to Frontierland. The theme of Frontierland is, of course, the Old West. 
Once again, a sanitized version where saloons serve French fries, but a fun version nonetheless. Front- this is another thing, like, after I had already written and recorded the narration, then it was just choosing the role, I do these additional little riffs in the, um, in the captions, which is uh, a technique that I did not stick with. And I, I feel like if I were doing it now, I would just say that joke out loud about uh, them looking them looking like uh, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal and Anne Hathaway slightly. Um, also, uh, all the music in the uh, Frontierland section here is from the Apple Dumpling Gang because uh, when possible, I was using, but like for the most part uh, early on, I was like, let's use Disney music where it makes sense to use Disney music. And uh, I, like, and let's got to a point where I was like, oh, but there's a different piece of music I really want to use. For the most part, I was like, let's use Disney music. So uh, Adventureland, uh, until Skipper Dan played, Adventureland was using music from Swiss Family Robinson. Adventureland is the and, uh, home of two of Disney's This is all music from Apple mountains. Dumpling Gang. We'll start with Disney's the one so Western. popular assures that Disney can never completely sweep Song of the South under the rug. Splash Mountain. It's hard to believe now, but this ride got its name because Michael Eisner, in his infinite wisdom, wanted it to be a promotional tie-in with the movie Splash. Yeah, I can't believe they didn't go with that idea. So, instead of going with the movie doomed to semi-obscurity, they decided to tie it in with the movie that the company always tries to force into obscurity, which backfires and turns into mysterious legend. Because the ride went so over budget, a lot of the animatronics were taken from a defunct attraction called America Sings. Yeah, I don't know anything about it. It was gone long before I ever went to the parks. Sadly, Splash Mountain was closed the first day I was getting footage at Magic Kingdom, so we came back another day. That's also a uh, relic of when this was a different thing, where, like, uh, so the, these these hand-drawn elements I included a little bit throughout the first one, throughout the first Dave Does Disney, and then uh, didn't really keep up with that just because they were taking so long to work on. But, um... Just the other element that I specifically mentioned that the first day I was gathering footage, it was closed because I thought people would notice, like, you're wearing a different shirt in the Splash Mountain footage, uh, but you said this was all your first visit to Disney World, and for some reason I thought it was important to make it clear which parts were from my very first visit and which parts were just my continued existence, and and... Yeah, that was an element that I didn't really keep in future theme park videos. The, the notion that it was my uh, first visit. Um, I did not pioneer park fans villainizing Eisner, but uh, but park tubers, I will take credit for that. Uh, yeah, I I I not uh, I did not invent the idea of blaming Eisner for the problems and conveniently forgetting all the things under his tenure, like the first half of his tenure that were actually good and exciting. <laughs> we are now in hour 12 of waiting in line for Splash Mountain. Also, these guys were all my coworkers in Florida at the time. Uh, I have barely kept up with any of them. I see them on Facebook occasionally, so... Uh, yeah. Fortunately, not all That's of us have resorted to cannibalism yet. How are you keeping yourself entertained on the Splash Mountain line, sir? Good evening. Ah, yes. Daniel, my friend, what are your thoughts on this uh, experience? Oh, we're about to lose another one. Both versions of Splash Mountain tell the same basic story, which is just one of the Uncle Remus stories with fewer racist overtones. There are a few differences between the coasts, but nothing I thought was worth mentioning because... Not quite we 12 all hours. Right we were, I was being hyperbolic. And you know what the ending is. You go up the hill, you go down the hill, you get really wet, and I turn into Jack Nicholson. Okay. The other- That's another one is, had I known how big this thing would get, I actually would have tried to get on the ride. Uh, but at the time, I didn't want to roll my camera on the big, splashy ride. So that is... Uh... So yeah, that, that that's another... Again, brushing past this stuff because I did not know how big this would get, and uh, if I had my druthers, it would have gotten even bigger. Another notable mountain is Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, the self-proclaimed wildest ride in the wilderness. 
I have no idea why I love this ride as much as I do. It's not really much of a roller coaster, and it's not really much of a theme ride. There's very little story, although you can pick up hints about a mining town, an ancient curse, and a runaway train. And it's not particularly scary, although there are some pretty sharp turns. But for some reason, I've just always loved this ride, and I try to ride it every time I visit Disneyland or Magic Kingdom. The next section of the park is Liberty Square, which I guess is the equivalent of Disneyland's New Orleans. This is one of the few pieces of uh, non-Disney music uh, from the aforementioned Sam and Max franchise. This music is from um, the uh, the Telltale Sam and Max games. Uh, this is the music from the White House sequence in the uh, moment where Max has to run for president against the possessed statue of Abraham Lincoln and that was just like want to reference the thing I like with the with the soundtrack here and like we said uh Disney doesn't own Sam and Max but they now own at least one entry in the Sam and franchise possibly more Orleans Square except with the colonial theme it's the home of the Hall of Presidents and more importantly the Haunted Mansion let me get this out of the way. I like the exterior of the Disneyland Haunted Mansion better. It just strikes me as more ominous and more of what I picture when I think of a haunted house. But the ride itself is basically the same with just a few minor differences. Andy. I did kind of understate, uh, understate how in Florida, the mansion is longer. But that is because uh, the hallway to get to the ride from the stretching room is shorter. So there are rooms on the actual ride that incorporate those things. And there's the M.C. Escher room, which California has never had. But California has the Hatbox Ghost now, so we still win. It's just as awesome. The effects don't turn up well in my crappy camcorder, but in person they really hold up quite well, despite some of them being virtually unchanged since the ride opened. Even when you can tell how an effect is done, you can't help but marvel at the ingenuity and brilliance of the Imagineers responsible. And of course, the ride features the legendary voices of Paul Fries and Thurl Ravenscroft which only reinforces my desire to see a boxing match between Toucan Sam and Tony the Tiger. Wild Forest bad enough sing to your mean one, Mr. Grinch. And yes, I drew all these bits because, again, I was including drawings in, in this first episode before I realized that is a waste of time that just makes this take even longer. After that chilling dip into the macabre, we move on to the section you may remember best from your childhood, Fantasy Land. I will say this about the Magic Kingdom's Fantasyland. The castle motif makes a little more sense than Disneyland's Bavarian Village motif, but at the same time, something about it feels a little less genuine. That is also uh, a thought that I should have elaborated on, that uh, I think Fantasyland's motif feels more, quote, genuine, because I don't really explain what I mean there. Uh, and I will in the Blitz California, but... Um, Part of it is just that despite being a much smaller footprint, uh, California's Fantasyland feels more like an expansive world to me, and Florida's Fantasyland, uh, or new Fantasyland, feels more like it's all extensions of the castle courtyard, whereas California's feels like, okay, there's the castle, but also I could see characters actually living here. So uh, that is my take, but I did not have the means of articulating that 10 years ago, so uh, I just sort of said a brief thing that didn't make a whole lot of sense. Still, the context. important things here are the rides, which are all kid-friendly. Well, some of them may be emotionally scarring, but there's no sudden drops. And that's gone. And it's nice to see and that's that gone. finally get the snack bar he so richly deserves. Magic Kingdom's Fantasyland shares a couple of rides with Disneyland, most prominently the Carousel and the Dumbo Ride. Others include Winnie the Pooh, The Mad Tea Party, Snow White's Scary Adventures, Peter Pan's Flight, and of course, It's a Small World. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. Oddly enough, the Magic Kingdom's version of Small World just blends in with the rest of the rides. If you weren't careful, you might accidentally walk in thinking you were riding something that wouldn't make you want to club an otter. Not like the Disneyland version, which looms ominously in the back of the park, warning everybody with that dreadful tick talking. Almost as if to say, abandon all hope ye who enter. Here there be earworms. I'm snarky about Small World here. I do not hate it as much as certain other people. I know. I, I There are actually a lot of things I like about Small World. But, you know, in the absence of insight, I lean towards snark. 
I have to talk about Peter Pan's flight for a minute because the Disneyland version was probably my first ever theme park ride, aside from some little things at Knott's Berry Farm. Peter Pan was my brother's favorite movie. And the first Knott's mention I've ever made on the internet. <laughs> when we were little, so naturally when we first went to Disneyland, we had to ride Peter Pan's flight as many times as we could. And every time we've been to Disneyland since, I had to ride it at least once just for nostalgia. I've done that ride so many times I have it completely memorized. And each time I ride it, I'm six years old again. As opposed to when I get off and I just act like I'm six years old. Now, the Magic Kingdom version. All right, that's it! M Mickey, what are you doing here? I've had it with your whining. It's all California's better this and California's better that. Both parks can't be exactly the same, you know? Well, well I'm sorry, but, but I grew up with Disneyland, you know? It was this awesome place we only got to visit once every few years, and as a kid, it was really the pinnacle of- Suck it, Gansel! Just find something about the park to enjoy, you whiny son of a- Okay, okay. So let's talk about Angry Mickey. <laughs> um, Angry Mickey came because, uh, Angry Mickey came about because I realized as I was going to the, you know, as I was writing and piecing this together more or less chronologically, I got to a certain point where I realized I am doing way too much, like too much of this video, way too much of this video is just me being, but I like it better in California. And I don't like one, I don't like being that, like I didn't want to brand myself as a cynical type of, um, type of person like that. Uh, I, I, that that was not the branding I wanted to go for. So I didn't want to be just the guy who whines about uh, liking it better on the other coast. And I didn't, um, like, I yeah, I, I basically realized I am sounding insufferable if all I'm going to do is complain about the other coast being better. So I need to be called out for how complainy I am about this. And I thought, who can call me out? It needs to be a character. And I thought of a couple different ways uh, I could go with this. I landed on Mickey because it was the character who it is easiest to do a bad impression of that still reads as Mickey. I, mean, I just kind of do angry falsetto, and, and it's, it's clear that it's supposed to be Mickey. Like, like every other character the voice needs a little more nuance to it than that for it to read as the character. Um, and uh, at one point I thought I would dub over actual cartoon footage, like from an actual cartoon of Mickey being angry. At another point, I thought I would dub over footage I had of the costume Mickey character and just dub the anger. And I don't remember why I got to the point where I decided I would hand draw it myself other than I was doing other hand drawing. Um, but yeah, I, I drew poorly drawn and Mickey and I drew all the mouth uh, motions and scanned them all in and put them all together in, you know, combination of Photoshop for the coloring and then just final cut itself for the animation. And uh, I, then reuse the same poses a lot over and over and over. Um, angry Mickey in just like a random white void. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, like I said, when when Angry Mickey was introduced, the idea was keeping me in check so that I'm not too annoying about my complaints. Like like Angry Mickey is the Sort of like, like he's the audience avatar in this first appearance. He's the one calling me out for my bullshit. Um, and then as Angry Mickey came back more and more, Angry Mickey became more of just a foil for me. So he just became a, a character who just angrily made fun of me, whether I deserve it or not. But like <laughs> he stopped being necessarily the audience avatar and more became just the uh, typical comedic foil who is uh just my sitcom rival as it were so uh yeah but but angry mickey began because i wanted him to be uh yeah 
um, uh, the um, he 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 was the one calling me out, and uh, like he is in the right in this particular rant. Uh, but uh, as as a result, ex exactly, he became my Statler slash Waldorf <laughs> at a certain point. But uh, even more hostile than Statler and Waldorf. I forget. Uh, I gave Mickey yellow pants buttons. I think I was going off of a specific uh, existing design where I had yellow pants. But I also might have just uh, done it because it stood out against the background better. I don't remember. I don't remember why I made the design choices I did. I, I just, you know, I'm not a very good cartoonist, but I can draw a character. And, and yeah, you'll note uh, in this very first appearance, Mickey's poses are, I hesitate to call them elaborate, but they are more elaborate than they would get later, where I basically just keep him in the hands-on hip pose and only do the mouth movements. But like in this first one, he's like hacking his foot and stuff. It, it, it is uh, like, I, again, I got very ambitious for this first episode and that's why it took over a year to edit. Look, I was just going to say the Magic Kingdom version is different. Some parts are bigger, some parts are smaller, some in different orders. But it's not really better or worse, it's just different. And while I personally prefer Disneyland for sentimental reasons, unlike with Pirates, there's really no concrete arguments to be made for one Peter Pan version being better or worse than the other. It's all just personal preference. But as long as we're talking about differences, I should take a moment to address the following rides present in Disneyland's Fantasyland, but not Disney World. Disney World does not have the Matterhorn bobsleds, the Storybook Land Canal Boat, the Casey Jr. Circus Train, the Alice in Wonderland ride, Pinocchio's Daring Journey, or Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. It used to have the latter, but that got replaced by Winnie the Pooh. In Disneyland, Winnie the Pooh replaced Country Bear Jamboree, which was probably Christopher Walken's doing. I also uh, checked uh, the Country Bears out of the library to rip this clip from. Uh, my only exposure to the Country Bears beforehand was it showing up in a certain other internet video person's video about Christopher Walken, uh, who I no longer watch. Um, and uh, so I knew sort of the memory of it from that, and I wanted the footage. So I checked Country Bears out of the library, and that was the first time I watched it. And I, I talked about this on uh, Escape from Vault Disney, but it was better than I expected it to be because, you know, Peter Hastings and Paul Rugg and Animaniac staff doing the best they could with the assignment they were given. Uh, so I, uh, yeah, I, I, I checked Country Bears out of the library to rip the DVD just for this cutaway reference. Still, I could be wrong, but I don't think people miss the Country Bears in California nearly as much as they miss Mr. Toad here. I mean, how many children's rides end with eternal damnation? One thing Magic Kingdom has that Disneyland doesn't is Phil Har Magic, a fun 3D show featuring Donald Duck interrupting several famous Disney musical numbers. If that this, this is another thing. Like today, I never would have just said this show exists. I would have actually done, if not full riff, then at least some sort of like going over of the plot and not just a brief summary. But again, I didn't have any footage of uh, Phil Har Magic and. There wasn't a lot of official That's footage available, which is why I just had to use this still image in talking about it. But uh, yeah. And it should. Then you'll enjoy the show. And naturally, if you're towing kids, you'll spend quite a lot of time in Fantasyland and probably a fair bit of time in Mickey's Toontown Fair. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> Again, uh, all, all, all of my... All, all of my... Yes, I, I agree. I, I like that it's called Mickey's Philhar Magic because in universe, we're supposed to be seeing Mickey's show and the fact that the tunnel show is part of the surprise. I, I am on board with all that. Um, so yeah, I, uh, this is where I sort of have my thoughts on Toontown in general where I'm kind of harsh on California's Toontown here. I do like California's Toontown. I still just think the whole 
theme park cartoon aesthetic. Theme park designers, like they figured out a lot of detail, but they haven't figured out how to actually make it look cartoony and not just look like concrete. But uh, so yeah, I'm harder on Toontown, California here than I would be otherwise. Hang on just one second. It was established in Roger Rabbit that Toontown is located near Hollywood, separated only by the Acme Factory and the tunnel from Back to the Future Part 2. Hence, it makes sense that Disneyland in California has a Toontown. So why does Orlando have a Toontown fair? Riddle me this, fat man. There's something about a summer. I think that was the first MSTJ clip we've seen. Wouldn't be the last. Your home conceit, which I guess makes some amount of sense. But really, Toontown's fair is on the opposite coast of Toontown itself. I mean, sure, cartoon characters can travel using physics bending methods, which probably helps them to deal with the distance, but... Also, that Mickey I drew there is clearly a completely different <laughs> design than your Mickey I drew, and I probably shouldn't have used the same character twice. Um, the Goofy I drew relaxing on the really, summer the home, I think, looks a lot better. Could have planned this out a little better. Anyway, both Toontown Fair and Toontown California have the requisite Mickey and Minnie houses and a family roller coaster. Orlando's coaster is themed after Goofy's biplane, while California's is a coaster designed by Gadget from the Rescue Rangers. It's just a family roller coaster either way, so the theme doesn't make much of a difference. But the Disneyland version is the only surviving attraction based on a Disney afternoon show. And that's pretty cool. There really should be a Darkwing Duck ride. Let's get dangerous. Toontown California is a lot bigger than Toontown Fair. Oh boy, here we go. Unlike Orlando, California has the Roger Rabbit ride and some other props and items throughout the area to add to the cartoony atmosphere. But really, neither two town goes as far as they could with this concept. Yeah, I know it's ridiculous to ask that I actually feel like I'm inside a cartoon in these areas, but the... Yeah, I also didn't have very much B-roll of Toontown Fair because we didn't spend a lot of time in Toontown Fair when I was there with my friends, so... Uh -huh. Even as a uh, preservation of these parks at this moment in time, this video does not do as well as it should have. The fact is, they don't really look cartoony, they just look fake. I probably shouldn't be picky because these areas really are aimed at the younger crowd, but as a grown man who is still a big fan of animation, I would like an area that did better justice to the cartoon world. Anyway, after that disappointing peek into cartoon geekery, we move on to sci-fi geekery with Tomorrowland! Welcome to the world of tomorrow! Why do you always have to say it that way? Haven't you ever heard of a little thing called showmanship? Come, your destiny awaits! I also probably used way too much of that Futurama clip. Probably should have cut it right after Welcome to the World of Tomorrow, but, uh... I, I don't know. Like, like I, I just feel like I'm using too much of other shows there, but... I also feel really like I'm plagiarizing less when I cut to a clip than when I just say a joke from another show, because at least if I cut to a clip, I'm acknowledging that uh, the other show did the joke first. But, uh, yeah, um, here, here's, here's, another, uh, here's another product of its time. <laughs> First off, there's the Monsters, Inc. Laugh Floor, which I haven't done yet, and the Stitch Great Escape, which I haven't done yet, and which was a kid's safe replacement of the reportedly much scarier Alien Encounter, which I've never done. Okay, I'll fess up. The only Tomorrowland rides I've done in Orlando are Space Mountain and Buzz Lightyear. The Buzz Lightyear ride is a fun, if simple, shooter. It's not quite sure if it wants to be based on Toy Story or the spin-off animated series, so we get cartoony images mixed with scale gags. The ride itself doesn't have many interesting animatronics, mostly just having flat cutouts of enemies you can shoot at, but the Buzz animatronics are cool and cleverly use a projection screen instead of an animatronic face. By the way, uh, if you support me on Patreon, this coming Thursday you'll get to see the... Uh... Disneyland Buzz Lightyear After Blasters section of the Blitz Trapiformia. That is coming out on Thursday. The effect isn't perfect, as the lighting on the face is weird, but it allows him to be a lot more expressive than he would be otherwise. The ride is pretty fun. I wouldn't wait in a very long line, but there are a few nice shoutouts for the three of us who actually watched the cartoon show. And of course, there's Space Mountain. While I generally enjoy theme rides and story rides more than roller coasters, Space Mountain is just awesome. It has enough of a theme in the line to satisfy me, and it's just a cool coaster. Now, at one point, the Disneyland version added a pretty sweet soundtrack. Hey, Vic, long time no see. Name I never learned how to pronounce, but whose work you're probably familiar with. That soundtrack is missing from the Orlando version, but that's a pretty minor complaint. And either way, Space Mountain is a fantastic experience. 
little pro tip, the picture is actually taken at the beginning of this ride, not during a drop, so if you want to pose, do so early. By this point, you're exhausted. What do you um, so this is my self-portrait, uh, but I believe the background, I can't remember if it is uh, still, it is either stills from my own footage or it is photos I got from the internet. And I think it's probably the latter. And I apologize again for not crediting the people I got photos from. It was 10 years ago. I, I am, uh, yes, I have changed my ways. I'm now much better at crediting everybody. At least when it's easy to find a credit. Like this is the problem when you like Google image search things, then it brings up like a Pinterest link. And it's like, I, I just want to know the original source of this image. You spend so much on your ticket that you can't leave now. You need to spend the whole day here. So you're pretty much obligated to stick around for the night entertainment, which of course includes an electrical parade and the Wishes fireworks show. Uh, so that footage was from when the parade was Spectre Magic, but between me filming that and me making the video, they had to replace Spectre Magic with the original Main Street Electrical Parade. So uh, I did not refer to it by name because I was not sure uh, what to. Um, <laughs> I, I was like, do I do I address what this thing's called, or do I just refer to what's there now? And I went with uh, ambiguity. Uh, this clip was shot uh, the same day as the Splash Mountain. Stuff. All right, we're trying to save our spots for the fireworks show here. It's uh, it's a feat of nightmarish proportions. Tell them a little about it, Lucky. There's too many people here. <laughs> That's the short version. Um, there's too many of them. More importantly, there's too many of those double-wide baby strollers that really honk up traffic. Um, we're pretty sure our friends aren't going to get back to us before the fireworks begin. Um, and in the highway, freeway, you know? And we just heard this whole diatribe from Jiminy Cricket about how this is supposed to be shared with friends. Well, it's really hard to do that. It's really hard to do that with all these strangers around. Thanks. You're a stranger, huh? No, you're, you're one of the friends, but okay. I, I don't know half these people. There's, there's got to be at least 12 people here. I don't know. I mean, now the fireworks are always cool and the medley of well-known Disney songs is fun, but the new music composed for the show is just kind of there. <laughs> Actually, where have I heard that melody before? Sonic, he can really move. Sonic, he's got an attitude. Sonic, he's the fastest thing. I was never a big uh, Sonic the, the Hedgehog kid, alive. but I remembered this show he's the and. I know there were people who liked wishes more than me so uh i did not re you know not really paying attention to what else was going on at the theme park media community i did not realize i was being an iconoclast by uh by finding the music of wishes bland but uh yes uh it, it was used in that in that um in 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 that um julie andrews narrated castle show I, I played some of the games back in the day at other people's houses because I uh, never owned any video game consoles myself growing up. But if my friends had Segas or Sega Genesis, I would uh, play Sonic a little bit, but not get very far because I was not great at video games, not being able to play them myself. Um, haven't seen the movie yet, but uh, we, Ali and I have Paramount Plus, so we'll probably see it. We'll probably get around to watching it pretty soon. Um, I like Ben Schwartz, and I'm glad that he's in it. Well, that's Magic Kingdom in a nutshell, a 20 minute nutshell. And honestly, while it has a few things I like. <laughs> that was also like a 20 minute nutshell, I'm saying like, yeah, it wasn't really that uh, abridged, but compared to the videos I would do later, that actually was a nutshell. <laughs> compared, to, uh, compared to where my videos would go, <laughs> this, this video is definitely a nutshell. Like better than Disneyland? Overall, it doesn't really hold up to its California counterpart. I know some of that is my own nostalgia clouding my judgment, but things like the shortened Pirates and the missing Fantasyland rides really hurt Disney World's score here. But there's still three other major parks to explore, and maybe they'll be more impressive. So join us next time when we visit Epcot. You're not off the freaking hook yet, mister!
I suppose you're gonna be all pissed off at Epcot for not having everything California Adventure has. Hey, hey now, uh, that, that's not fair. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna give it a fair shot. If there's something I don't like, I'll address it, but... Yeah, cram it! I don't want to hear it, you freaking douchebag! Mickey Mouse just called me a douchebag. I should have listened when my grandfather said... And that's the first, uh, Dave Does Disney episode. That's the first episode released 10 years ago this Friday. That, 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 that's, uh, it, 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 it's, it's hard to believe. It's, for better or worse, this has changed my life in so many ways, and, uh, yeah, I, yeah, so yeah, I uploaded that unlisted to YouTube 10 years ago yesterday, uh, and probably private to blip at the same time, and then I uh, waited until Friday. I don't remember why, I was just like, I wanted to have some buffer before releasing them, and um, and yeah, that was the first episode. Uh, we will go through some of the others shortly 